Some interesting news as well. Rivian Vans no longer subject to an Amazon exclusivity deal. I think it's a meltdown in investor expectations and certainly in the uh, stock prices. Um, in terms of EV adoption, it's probably more a slowdown, you know, for the time being. But the expectations were so high that we're really seeing a collapse in this. Electric vehicles in reverse. How the world's biggest automakers are scaling back their green ambitions. All that and more. So let's get to it. Tesla stock is down in the pre-market, but not by much. And as you can tell, the volatility has been ridiculous. Tesla currently has a market cap of a little over $700 billion. 52-week high of almost $300 and a 52-week low of almost $100. Yesterday seemed like a narrowing of that volatility. Lower highs, higher lows. It looks to me that Tesla is ready to break one way or the other and in grand fashion. But time will tell. On Rivian, of course, coming out with its earnings report, looks like it sees its full year production forecast up slightly. Uh, it also met it as its estimates overall. And here's uh, some interesting news as well. Rivian Vans no longer subject to an Amazon exclusivity deal. Let's get some details now with Ed Ludlow. He, of course, is the co-anchor of Bloomberg Tech, joining us in New York this week. And Ed, we can get to the numbers, but let's talk about what's going on with that Amazon agreement. Yeah. What does this mean for Rivian? Yeah, it's big for the company. Inside, a lot of staff have been super frustrated uh, because they want to sell their battery electric delivery van to so many more. So what it means in the first instance is they can do just that. They're free to talk to third parties. Actually, I know from sources that they probably have been speaking to third parties outside of Amazon. You're talking about fleet operators, right? People that operate all kinds of last mile delivery services. Um, you know, in the, the, when the deal was signed in 2019, it basically gave Amazon two years of genuine exclusivity from the time the first van was, was delivered and then two rights of first refusal on everything that Rivian builds. And the van's about 25% of total production. So this frees them up and it's what investors wanted to see too. Okay, here's my question though. Sure. Like under the original deal, uh, and Rivian says it still plans to honor its deal to deliver 100,000 yep. vans to Amazon by 2030, but they're not making a whole lot of these vehicles either, yeah. right? No. Ding, 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 ding. Tell them what she's won, Johnny. Your mother. Right. It's good that you're not under daddy's thumb anymore, but you're still not making a whole lot of vans as it is. Third parties to include, but not limited to, like Walmart will be highly interested in Rivian's product if they can ramp up to production in any meaningful scale. So what I'm saying is don't expect Rivian to be announcing any real partnerships with anyone as they still need to fulfill their commitment to Amazon. This also means that beyond the 100,000 vans that Amazon has been promised, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna have input on vehicle design any longer. Rivian will be free to make the van any which way they choose for any which customers that really want their products. This should lower the cost to produce the vehicle and free up any production snafus that happen to occur when an Amazon official says, no, nah, we need it done this way. Sorry. They're only making 52, 54,000. So it's why it's important to pass the numbers. They have updated guidance. So this year they'll build 54,000 EVs across their two consumer products and the Amazon van. But to intents and purposes, they are supply constrained. They can yes. not meet the demand that's out there. But on paper, that facility in Normal Illinois is capable of building much more than they're currently doing. And, you know, I think the fact that they raise guidance isn't a surprise to anyone, really. You know, the after hours move in this stock more likely to do with that they can now go out and, and plan to sell this, this um, product to others. Remember, the second part of that ex exclusivity, first dibs on everything that's built, that's mm -hmm. no longer there. Mm -hmm. So as long as they meet the 100,000 by 2030, they can sell vans to others and they can manage that process. And again, vans is 25% roughly of everything they build. They have to scale really quickly then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, you talk about scaling and uh, you think about, let's talk about the forecast a little bit. I mean, 54,000 vans, it's not very much. Yeah, it's not 54,000 vans. That's R1Ts, R1Ss, and vans. 25% of 54,000 will be vans. I often speak on how Tesla's production is very, very small. And compared to what it'll be in 2030, it is. But when you're talking about Rivian's production, they're just a tiny little infant when it comes to producing battery electric vehicles. But they're well ahead of American Legacy Auto. 100,000 vans by 2030 will be a Herculean feat for Rivian. 
I, I reported earlier this year, uh, citing sources who were in a meeting with, with the leadership team, that they told staff on paper this year they could probably do 62,000. Oh. And the market's always kind of questioned how conservative this yeah. guide is. The facility in Normal, Illinois, based on the machinery that's there, can probably build 150,000 units a year. So you can see the path forward. One thing I always forget to mention, Amazon owns almost 17% of Rivian still, and they still have the deal for 100,000 units. But, you know, I love covering this, this company because there's still intense Bloomberg Terminal readership interest yeah. around the world. People follow it really closely because it's kind of like actually managed to do it, whereas so many other EV upstarts have struggled. <laughs> must be coming down with something. Our next guest is predicting a, quote, global EV meltdown, while the other's outlook is quite positive. Joining us today, former Ford CEO Mark Fields, now a Hertz board member and CNBC contributor, and Deutsch's lead auto analyst, Emmanuel Rosner. Guys, it's great to have you. Emmanuel, I, I, your note raised some eyebrows a few days ago where you talked about the early playbook for such a meltdown. And we've talked about sticker shock and range anxiety and the lack of new models and gas prices are tame. But is meltdown the right word to use? <laughs> I think it's a meltdown in investor expectations and certainly in uh, stock prices. Um, in terms of EV adoption, it's probably more a slowdown you know, for the time being, but the expectations were so high that we're really seeing a collapse in this. And to your point, it's about affordability and it's other sort of things like range anxiety, but on the affordability side, what concerns us is most automakers haven't cracked the economics to make an EV affordable. And as a result, we don't really see a pass in the near term for this to happen. It could take several years until such models come out. And this is going to continue to put tremendous pressure, I think, on uh, both their earnings, but also probably on the stock prices. Can't produce better electric vehicles affordably. Hmm. There's only one company I know that's doing it pretty good. Mark, even some players who've uh, tried to leverage uh, the growth, Hertz is a great example, have uh, come out in the past few days talking about some of the challenges. Well, you know, clearly what we've seen, Carl, is, listen, the bottom line is EV demand is cooling as the early adopter phase kind of kind of wanes off. Uh, but, you know, you got a challenge in the industry. And listen, I, I, I hear Emmanuel's uh, term around an EV meltdown. Uh, I think that's very true, particularly for the new companies uh, that have come on and are solely EVs and at very high price points. I think the established OEMs, you know, like GM, Ford, uh, Stellantis, et cetera, listen, they're going to have challenges, but, you know, they, they have their ICE business, which the total combustion engine business, which helps fund uh, their investments in EVs. Uh, and it's going to take longer now because you're seeing almost the... Uh, the EV market is acting very much like uh, what I would say the, the industry of old, the auto industry of old, with price cuts, rising inventory, increased incentives to kind of juice market demand. Uh, and you're seeing the automakers, you know, take a very rational approach that says, listen, we were ahead of the curve here in terms of consumer acceptance, so we're going to push back investments. Uh, but from where we stood six months ago, it's going to be a more challenging time for everyone involved in the EV uh, uh, market right now. Oh, man. Internal combustion engine sales are currently funding the legacy automaker's EV push, which is a direct conflict of interest in every phase of selling battery electric vehicles. On the manufacturing side, you have to divvy up your supply chain to meet these needs, and in many cases, create new sources so that you can have battery electric vehicles. None of this stuff is cheap, by the way, especially with what you have been doing with hybrids and internal combustion engines. You find out that when you finally do put the vehicle together, that it costs way more than anything you've ever made. So now you have to price them like they're Teslas and they're not. Are you surprised that inventory levels are rising? Speaking of which, you then push them off to the dealership where some sleazy car salesman now has to make the decision well, if I sell them the internal combustion engine, I can also probably get some oil changes out of these guys. They will keep coming back to the dealership. But if I sell them this electric version, I will see them less and uh, probably will invite them to go be Tesla customers in the future. I wonder which one I'll choose.
As for Hertz's difficulty, Teslas are magical vehicles that never break down. I've been fortunate that my maintenance has been minimal to zero. Now you throw in the mix that you're using them as a rental car and there's thousands of users. Be ready for some complications. Come on Hertz, you know everybody drives your vehicles extra hard. Now you have this high performance new vehicle. You had to expect people to push these things to its limits, right? Right? Mark used that word challenging twice. So what does that actually look like? <clears throat> does it delay, but it, it still means the transition comes? Uh, or, you know, are we waiting a lot longer, perhaps? Well, I think it's this is going to be an inexorable, in my view, transition in propulsion systems. But to your point, David, it's going to take longer than everybody expected. I can only imagine what this is going to do with projections. They're already piss poor. This is an exponential curve that's going to happen with or without the legacy automakers of the United States. At, at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're having the established automakers pushing out these investments to save capital. But let's face it, General Motors is still sticking to their, their plan of having a million units of production capacity by the end of 2025. And as they close out 2023, you know, they'll be challenged. They'll be selling slightly less than 100,000 EVs. So that's a 10x increase in the next two years. And yes, they're coming out with new products. But at the end of the day, the, the challenges for consumers are cost. Uh, you know, EVs still, even though they've come down significantly this year, about 20, 25 percent, they're still more costly than ICE vehicles. But most importantly, and you mentioned this, David, is the, the, the it, it used to be called range anxiety. I actually think it's charging anxiety at this point because of the lack of charging infrastructure. Yeah, there's no way GM's going to reach that 1 million by 2025. They'll be lucky to reach 1 million by 2030 because they're probably on the path of bankruptcy. I can't stress this enough. It's not about quantity of electric vehicles. Tesla's approach has proven to be a very effective way to not only be profitable, but to sell millions of vehicles, both of which GM is striving to do. It's not quantity, it's quality. Getting into electric vehicles, it may be harder than it looks. We're going to be number one mid-decade in EVs in the U.S. Bullshit. As we get further into the transformation to EV, uh, it's, it's a bit bumpy. You don't say. We're going to invest whatever it takes to drive our growth initiatives on battery electric vehicles and our connected uh, vehicles. Ford announced yesterday they are delaying $12 billion of planned EV spending uh, indefinitely, potentially even raising the possibility of canceling it. General Motors and Honda announcing that they will be co-developing lower-priced EVs. Honda is planning to haul plans with GM to develop smaller electric vehicles. The report saying Honda CEO said changes in the business environment for that decision. Not as easy as Tesla makes it look, right? Tesla, the pure play EV king, it's getting hit. Even a great ship in a storm has challenges. So what happened? This week on Tech Check, electric vehicles in reverse. How the world's biggest automakers are scaling back their green ambitions. Electric vehicles were supposed to be the wave of the future. It's not? President Biden announcing that he's going to be signing an executive order setting a pretty ambitious target of 50% of electric vehicles to be sold in the United States by the year 2030. It's pretty clear that this transition is going to happen. This is where the world is going. And automakers had big plans. General Motors setting a goal to sell EVs exclusively by 2035. $27 billion will be invested by 2025. 30 new EVs by 2025, many of them in North America and here in the United States. They've got a long ways to go. Ford announcing $30 billion in EV investments, targeting 40% electric car sales by 2030 in what they called their Ford Plus plan. We're going to make the moves we need to make to drive this growth plan and, and continue to execute our uh, Ford Plus plan. And of course, Tesla. Elon Musk has for years been making bold predictions about the rise of EVs. But they're going to grow exponentially. So there's a big difference between five and 10 years. My guess is probably in 10 years, more than a half of uh, new vehicle um, production is electric in the United States. 
but now the EV promise is moving into reverse. Just in October, Ford announced it was postponing $12 billion of that planned EV investment and pulled its full year forecast, saying customers are unwilling to pay premiums for EVs over gas or hybrid vehicles. GM delaying production of its electric pickup truck at a Michigan plant, ditching its goal of building 400,000 EVs by mid-2024, and scrapping a $5 billion plan with Honda to make affordable EVs. Even Tesla isn't immune, hinting that it could delay construction of a new gigafactory in Mexico, which was supposed to make its more accessible and affordable car. I think we want to just get a sense for what the global economy is like before we go full tilt um, on the Mexico factory. Obviously, there's two different reasons why Elon might be talking about not going full tilt on the Mexican factory, which is going to be built regardless, and why Ford, GM, they're pulling back their production to even get started. Elon's concerns happen to be interest rates, whereas GM and Ford, their customers are choosing to purchase the internal combustion engine variant or the hybrid version of their vehicles. These are two separate problems. So why are all these companies pumping the brakes? Well, you heard Elon Musk mention the economy. More than 100 million Americans have a car loan and higher interest rates only hike those monthly payments. If interest rates remain high or if they go even higher, uh, it's that much harder to for people to buy the car. They simply cannot afford it. And though none of the automakers have cited the UAW strikes, analysts believe that it and other macro factors are only adding to the pressure. And this has long been the thesis of some analysts like Adam Jonas yeah. and Morgan Stanley that uh, the pressure uh, of the strike and the realization that combustion engines still churn off a ton of cash, not to mention gas prices that haven't exactly gone to the moon, right. would force some of the D3 to uh, adjust their, their adoption curve. Analysts also suggest that Everyone who was gonna buy an EV already has one. The early adopters, the people who bought the $60,000, $70,000 Teslas, those guys are kind of done already. When you adopted your smartphone versus your flip phone, did you stop after just one? You probably bought many, many smartphones since the adoption. Now granted, you're buying phones more frequently than you are buying cars, but if you've made the transition as an early adopter to battery electric vehicles, odds are in the next three to five years, you may be interested in an upgrade. This early adopter thing that's over, uh, seems quite nonsensical to me. Sorry for the interruption. It's been about three years since the wife purchased her Model Y. I'm gonna go check the delivery status of the Model X that should be coming in the next month. Continue. And it doesn't help that EVs are on average more than $10,000 more expensive than conventional cars. So EVs are essentially expensive for what they are, they sell at a premium to ICE. And that's, I think, you know, basically limiting this uh, adoption curve from, you know, rising uh, as fast as people essentially expected. All of that is slowing demand. GM called out slower near-term growth in demand and said it was reworking some of its manufacturing to make vehicles less expensive to produce and more profitable. And that gets at another key obstacle. Just how costly is it to make EVs, even for an industry that has a reputation of being one of the most capital intensive in the world? You lost 2.1 million billion, I should say, right. last year. You're gonna lose about 3 billion this year. Damn! You hear the chatter, there are people are saying, when are you gonna make money on EVs? Right. Well, it's a startup buried within Ford Motor Company. But when you look at the path for our EVs, we are losing money now, but we're a startup, we're scaling, we're developing the products. Companies invested billions, but may have overestimated demand, and that has crushed stock prices. You can't overestimate an exponential growth curve of adoption. <laughs> can't stress that enough. You have no idea when that thing's gonna go vertical. And if you're caught with your pants down when it does, it'll be too late. Companies have planned massive investment on the premise of much faster adoption of EVs, this is not playing out. It is essentially a real meltdown of expectations, which has resulted in a meltdown of stock prices. And the biggest of them all, that's Tesla. As Morgan Stanley puts it, in the past few years, the strategy for legacy automakers making electric vehicles has come down to two words, copy Tesla. Easier said than done. Tesla actually gave us a huge gift with the laser focus on cost and scaling the Model Y. They set the standard. 
But now it's looking like even Tesla may not make it work. It began aggressively slashing prices this year as demand waned and the rivals piled in. Tesla under pressure after drastically cutting prices uh, for some cars sold in the US and Europe. These are the fifth price cuts since January. Tesla just did another round of price cuts. And that caused the closely watched gross auto margins, which measures vehicle profitability, to shrink. This is really the battleground. This is the center vortex of the whole Tesla story. It's about margins. To the analyst, it may be about margins, but to Tesla, it's about accelerating the world's transition to a sustainable energy economy. And as long as your demand is in excess of your production with industry leading margins, I think you're doing pretty good. Tesla's once eye-popping margins were what bulls used to justify its valuation. Evidence that it was more tech disruptor than automaker. The most expensive Model X has seen price cuts up to 30%. So that's gonna weigh on margins, the operating margin down to in the 7% range. I mean, we're getting closer to normal automakers. It's not being valued like a normal automaker. Are we though? I mean, industry leading margins? But margins peaked at 30% at the end of 2021, and they've only been on a steady decline ever since. Coming in this quarter, 16.3% down from 18.1 in the second quarter, and at their lowest since at least mid-2019. It signaled to investors that the enormous profit Tesla had been raking in over the past few years might have been an exception. The story that got Tesla to an $800 billion market cap is, is not really there anymore. A product of the pandemic free money era and supply chain disruptions that hampered rivals, allowing Tesla to jack up prices. And you gotta wonder how much they'll have to cut prices in order to move all that inventory. They even talk about advertising. This was not, not, not the Tesla of the last few years. I thought they had to raise prices because the demand and wait times went through the roof for about a year. And while these financial analysts would have you believe that Tesla is still producing the same number of vehicles that they were when the wait times were blown out for a year, since those crazy price hikes, Tesla has doubled their production. It stands to reason that there are more cars available for people to purchase. Price has to naturally come down for it to meet the total addressable market for the current level of production. This Nutty. Its stock tanked at one point, wiping out almost a fifth of the company's value in just a matter of weeks. Other parts of the bull case thesis, its cyber truck, its self-driving car unit, also tempered. Signs that it still has long ways to go before it can be called a true tech giant. The next hurdle for Tesla and American EVs, challengers from China. The real competition for Tesla today is, is in China, whether it's BYD, GAC, Aon, a handful of other manufacturers and the question then becomes if that technology or those brands can can come to the US. One of the biggest threats, Berkshire Hathaway backed BYD, sold over 100,000 more EVs worldwide than Tesla in the first quarter of 2023. Um that number has hybrids in it. I mean, come on now. What narrative are you truly trying to paint? And China has done what the U.S. hasn't been able to do when it comes to EV ambitions. Penetration has skyrocketed, reaching 35% from less than 5% in 2020. And China has done what the U.S. hasn't been able to do when it comes to EV ambitions. Penetration has skyrocketed, reaching 35% from less than 5% in 2020. Compare that to just 10% penetration in the U.S., far behind the national target of 50% by 2030 and showing signs of slipping. There's a lot behind that, as Bernstein points out. Legacy automakers had a huge head start making conventional cars with pure play EVs. It's a more level playing field and Chinese companies have leapfrog American ones. That's also brought down the price of Chinese EVs. In the US, EVs are sometimes 40% higher than that of a similar internal combustion engine vehicle. In China, they're actually cheaper. Americans also tend to drive more and longer distances. The average annual distance here is about 23,000 kilometers versus just 12,000 in China. California though, that's a state leading the charge. Their EVs have already reached 25% adoption and lawmakers haven't abandoned their commitment that every new car sold by 2035 will be electric. Question now is, can they deliver or will it be another walk back in the EV reversal? Getting into electric vehicles may be harder than it looks. If you don't think that the adoption rate that's happening in China and Europe doesn't come over here to the US, you must be sucking the glass if you think that that's not going to occur. 25% in California? There's an old adage, how California goes, so too does the rest of the country.
No one said the transition to better electric vehicles would be easy, especially for the legacy automakers. The Detroit 3, their growing pains are going to be incredible. In conclusion, Rivian isn't seeing any issues with their EV demand. As a matter of fact, they raised guidance. Imagine that. In addition, they ended their Amazon exclusivity deal, but uh, they're gonna have to ramp up production before that has any meaning whatsoever. And apparently EVs have lost their spark here in the United States. Perception is reality, and uh, the news media seems to be peddling this perception quite vigorously for whatever reason. But it don't bother me none. The more people think that this fad is over, the cheaper the stock price, the more I'll be able to purchase. That's all I have for you today. Be easy. Purr.